Thank you very much. Welcome back. I hope you all had a great weekend. Um, I hope you didn't forget everything I told you about how this works. Nevertheless, let me remind you what the setup is. And then today I want to come really to the theorem, right? I haven't stated the big theorem yet. The theorem that says that ginzburg landau theory actually can be arrived from this BCS model. Okay, let me remind you also this BCS model, that's a minimization problem. You have somehow, I don't know, learned in high school how to minimize when you have numbers. Then in functional analysis, you learn to minimize over functions. And now what you do here is we minimize over operators. Okay, that's perhaps a little bit unusual. You might not have seen this before, but conceptually there is nothing really complicated going on. Okay, so the operators that we're going to minimize over, they're denoted by capital gamma and this so-called free energy functional which depends on the temperature t there well has three parts the first part so i apologize i mean as last time there will be a script h and a usual h the usual h is the semi-classical parameter the script h is the one body operator whose form i remind you in a second okay so and I should also remind you about the capital gamma. Capital gamma is, as I said, an operator. It's an operator on two copies of L2 of Rd. And we usually write these operators in, in block form. And so there's the little gamma is the 1-1 the one, one entry. The alpha is the 1-2 entry. And the other, I mean, this is because of this formalism. This is alpha bar, which is the same as alpha star. And there's a one minus gamma bar over there. Gamma bar denotes the operator uh, conjugated by complex conjugation. All right, so the first part of the functional just couples the gamma, this is the one one entry, to this one body operator. Good. The third part in the functional involves an integral over an interaction potential which we have um, scaled here so this is x minus y over h and now here's alpha of x and y squared dx dy so remember alpha is an operator on l2 of of rd and alpha of x comma y denotes its integral kernel this will be a, a Hilbert Schmidt operator, and so, so there is no problem about the existence of an integral kernel. And I remind you also that these um, operators, the gamma and the alpha, they're periodic operators on L2 of Rd. And so therefore, here this integral is an integral over Rd times the, the torus. TD and this trace is interpreted in the sense per unit volume. Okay, so here these are the, the two terms. This, these are the particles, the ordinary particles, say electrons, and the, this involves this so called Cooper pair function. And now here's a coupling between those two, and that's given by the trace of this gadget here gamma log gamma, and in front we write a T, which is the temperature. Okay, and then let me remind you just to make the formulas appear a little bit nicer. I multiply by h to the power d, where d is the dimension. And now this object, I also have to remind you the script h, that is minus i h nabla plus h a squared plus h squared w minus mu. Okay, this A is a vector field and W is a, a real valued function. And so I remind you that there are three parameters in the game which are all coupled. The first one is this H here. That is the quotient between the microscopic scale, that's the scale on which the electrons or your particle live and the scale on which the external fields, the A and the W, live. Okay, and we will take a limit where somehow the, the electrons, they, they interact on very, very small scales, but we watch the system on a scale of size one. Okay, that's the first H. 
The other H is the one that I wrote in front of the A and in front of the W. That means that the external fields that we apply are weak. And it turns out, and I tried to motivate this, that the right thing to do is to have them of size h squared, to couple these things. And then the third thing that's in the game is the temperature. The temperature has got to be close to the critical temperature. Which critical temperature? Well, the one that we computed in the very first lecture in by the translation variant model. Okay? And yet again, this difference, the difference between the temperature to the critical temperature, that also should be of size h squared. Okay? So all these three parameters that are a priori in the game are coupled in such a way that one, one arrives at a nice limit. One can, of course, do the limit in all the other cases. They will just be, be easier or trivial. Okay. And then last time we also computed the energy of the normal state. Remember, normal state means that we just uh, think that alpha is equal to zero. So this term is absent. This is a diagonal matrix. And then this is a little computation. OK. And now let me make an assumption that will be important for all the following. And namely, I will assume, well, first of all, Tc is greater than zero. Tc is defined in the first lecture, and I'll remind you in a second what this is. And remember, there was this operator Ktc. So Kt was equal minus Laplacian minus mu divided by tanj minus Laplacian minus mu divided by 2t. Okay, so that's a Fourier multiplier. It's a Fourier multiplier that depends monotonously on t, and the tc was just defined as that point of t where the eigenvalue crosses zero. And so we assume that this happens at some positive tc. Where the first eigenvalue crosses zero. So I'm assuming that this kernel here is one dimensional. And I'll denote a function in the kernel by a star and, well, let's say we normalize the function to be one. I told you that this is not always satisfied, but it turns out that in most physically relevant cases it, it is it is satisfied. I mean, this is, is now really, you plug in numbers and you compare with temperatures that you have in experiments and then it turns out to be verified. There is no deeper theoretical meaning. Without this assumption, I think things would be, uh, come much more complicated. Okay, so let me define now two things, namely the critical temperatures. And we've got to be a little bit more careful because in the translation variant model, we've seen there is one critical temperature below which you have superconductivity, above you don't. Now, that doesn't have to be like this in the case for this more general model. So we have to be careful what we mean by critical temperatures. And really, there are two critical temperatures. There are really two natural candidates. Let me write those down. So there's a Tc lower, which is the smaller of the two. And that's the one such that below you always have superconductivity. Okay. See, the problem is you might have for small temperatures always superconductivity. Then you're in a kind of transition regime where you have superconductivity, then not, then yes, then not. And then eventually you come to a regime where you do not have a superconductivity anymore. So therefore, we have to be more careful, use... Um, these upper and lower critical temperatures. So that's the largest temperature such that below, right? So below, so I have a Ft prime. Below that, I always have superconductivity for all T prime less than T. And then we also have an upper critical temperature, you can imagine what that will be. That's the one above which you never have superconductivity. Okay, so it's the smallest T and actually in a, in a very strong sense. Um, so whenever you take a state which is not the normal state, then we require that the free energy is strictly greater 
than the, than the energy of the normal state. and for all t prime greater than t. Okay? So that's just, I mean, if you don't know that you have a unique point where, where things change, then you have to define a, a smaller one and a larger one. But we'll see in a second that that distinction is actually not really needed for practical purposes. And this is the, the first of uh, two important theorems here. So. Well, so these temperatures, of course, depend on these parameters, H. And what this first theorem says is, makes mathematically rigorous, is this fact that you really want to change the temperature by order H squared in order to see something. So this theorem says, let's look at um, Tc, say the lower one. and Tc is the one that's defined in the translation variant model, then, well, not only does the, the Tc lower converge to the Tc, but we can also say what the um, deviation is, namely the devi deviation is proportional to h squared and given by a constant that we know. And, moreover, the same is true for the h upper, and the deviation is the same. Okay, so where dc is equal to 1 over lambda 2 in spec minus i Navla plus 2a star lambda 0 minus i Navla plus 2a plus lambda 1 w. Okay, so this thing here, let's, let's look at this thing here first. This thing is an operator in L2 of the torus with periodic boundary conditions. And it depends on certain numbers. There's a capital lambda zero, that's a matrix. It's a d by d matrix, it's positive definite. There's a lambda one, which is a real number. And there's a lambda 2 that we've already seen in the first talk. It's exactly the one from the first talk where I wrote down, down some very complicated expression. I will not write down this ex the expressions for lambda naught and lambda 1, but it's exactly the same thing. So you, you look at this guy here, the alpha, st uh, the A star, and you take the square of this, or the, f the square of the Fourier transform, you multiply it by some complicated function of xi, and you do the integral. And that defines these numbers. How do we interpret this result? Well, this result says that, so you have a microscopic theory. The microscopic theory depends on mu and v. Out of that, the only thing you need to remember from the microscopic theory is this thing here. This operator, you have to compute its kernel, and then you get this function a star. Once you have that, you can forget everything about what the electrons do. Then you can compute these numbers, uh, lambda naught, lambda one, and lambda two. And then once you have done, these are three coefficients, so I mean this is really a matrix. But then you have these coefficients, and now you do something macroscopic, right? This thing lives on the size of your system. And on that size of the system, you have to compute an eigenvalue. The lambdas do not depend on the external fields A and W, but here they enter. Okay, so this says that to um, leading order, the critical temperature coincide with the translation variant temperatures, but then the external fields shift these temperatures by an amount h squared, and this amount h squared can be computed from a macroscopic model. Okay, 
So that theorem really says that if we want to understand something, um, I mean, get a non-trivial limit, we better take some temperatures which are on order h squared away from Tc. So then if a is wr0, then dc is 0. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. And in general, you see somehow the, the magnetic field, usually by the diamagnetic inequality, raises the, the eigenvalue, say w is equal to zero, then this eigenvalue is really strictly positive. Okay, so which means then, remember there's a minus dc, that the critical temperature is actually lowered due to a magnetic field. Okay, lowered to order h squared. Mm. Lambda, is lambda 2 also given by some formula? Yes, exactly. Right, right, exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I could write them on the board, but I don't think there, there is much. Yeah. Good. Um, you see, I mean, what this says is somehow we do not, we're not able to prove that the critical temperature is unique. But we know that it's almost unique. Somehow, if there is a range where superconductivity disappears and then reappears and then disappears for good, say, then this range is little o of h squared. Okay, so it's uh, and it would be something that could not be explained by Ginzburg-Landau theory. So we cannot rule this out. There's no general monotonicity argument, like in the translation variant case. But at least this is somehow such a small range that that it's not important, really. OK, so that was the theorem of the, the critical temperatures. And now the, the other theorem, that's the theorem about Ginzburg-Landau theory. So I call this derivation of GL theory. I'm still working under this assumption, right? See, the assumption is simply needed in order to have these, these lambdas well defined. If there would be several elements in the kernel, there would be several choices about these, these parameters. So here's this theorem. So now we take some arbitrary d and we look at temperatures which differ exactly by the amount h squared from Tc and mm, we the proportionality constant we denote by d. Okay, that's the, what this theorem, this theorem told us that this is the interesting range. This is where things, uh, things might happen. So let's do this. Let's take the, the limit where temperature is coupled to the mm, scale h and then as h goes to 0, the free energy, or the minimum of the free energy, well, to leading order, of course, it's given by the normal state, right? Because we're close to the critical temperature where the superconductivity disappears. And then there's a correction. And yet again, it's an h to the 4 correction and it's given by some number that can be determined by a variational problem. I'm writing here little o of h to the power 4. We have remainder estimates. There would be some powers. So I think for the upper bound, it's h to the power 5. And for the lower bound, it comes from some not so optimal things. But let's, let me just keep it like this. Um, where? The ED is equal to the infimum of the ginzburg landa functional Okay, and let me write down what the ginzburg landa functional is. So it's a Ginzburg-Landau theory on the torus. As I told you, we're not able to deal with boundary terms. And there is the a gradient term. Mm. 
Okay, it's okay, thanks. So the, it's like this term here, right? So there's a minus i nabla plus 2a psi squared plus a lambda 1w psi squared minus lambda 2d times psi squared plus lambda 3 psi 4. And these lambdas are the same as over there. And in particular, the lambda 2 and the lambda 3, they're exactly those given in the first lecture. In the first lecture, remember I told you I can derive the Mexican head shape of this thing. And so the new version of this theorem, when you break translation variance by these external fields, then you get these additional terms. So the lambda 0 and the lambda 1 are the new things here. I want to emphasize one thing, which is already up, appears already up there. When you look at the, the one particle operator in the definition of FT, this script H operator, right? You have a A, the external vector potential, is coupled with a 1 relative to the gradient. Over here, there's a 2. That's a very important thing. So. The, the physics explanation of this is somehow that this really describes pairs. It's a Cooper pair wave function. Okay? And so if you remember, what you should write in front of the vector potential is the charge of the particle. And so if the charge of this, this thing couples to gamma, which means electrons, if they have charge 1, then the pairs have charge 2. So that explains the factor 2. I know whether this really is explains. I mean, it's rather the mathematics. You do the mathematics and you find this and then you have to interpret the two and then you come up with that this really describes pairs. So I don't know, I mean, you know, which is first. But it's, a, in, it's certainly an important fact and it's perhaps a little bit surprising because at first sight it looks a little bit like it would somehow break um, gauge invariance. But it does not. I mean, it has to be. And it's really one of the fundamental things in the interpretation of this theory. Let me compare these two theorems. It's at least on, on a formal level, you could say that this theorem up there follows from this theorem. Why is that? That's because, see, let's talk about the, the minimal energy, the minimal um, Ginzburg-Landau energy. Now, when the quadratic part of the functional is positive, that's exactly when d is smaller than this dc. Okay? Then certainly the nonlinear functional is positive because I'm adding something positive. And the 3, remember, is a positive number. Okay? Now, conversely, if I can make the linear part negative, well, then I multiply the psi by a tiny constant, the psi quart to the power 4 becomes even tinier, so it doesn't matter and doesn't destroy the negativity. So this dc is, so to speak, the critical temperature in Ginzburg-Landau theory. Okay, that's exactly where somehow, where in ginzburg so in Ginzburg-Landau theory also you have a transition, namely between a psi which is identically zero and a psi which is non-zero. The transition happens at this dc, is up there and somehow what this theorem, theorem up there says is that the, the, the change in the PCS critical temperature is given by this um, Ginzburg-Landau critical temperature. Okay and so therefore often I mean th this is usually interpreted as a temperature in Ginzburg-Landau theory but really you should think of it as kind of this uh, renormalized uh, temperature where you somehow subtract the real thing and then pass to a limit and that's what it is. Okay, that's how it comes about. Good. Are there any questions at this point about the statement of the theorem? Okay, good. Then let me describe well, okay, now let me per perhaps I should perhaps I should continue this thought. So, right, so I mean but this, why are these two things related? So if d is um, such that this functional is 
positive, or I mean, this would mean that this ED is equal to zero. You can always, uh, this ED is always uh, less or equal than zero. So if this thing is equal to zero, right, then it said that from this theorem, we conclude that there is no superconductivity to leading order in h to the power four. That, however, is a weaker statement than the one that I make up there because there I say there is really no superconductivity at all to no order in H. Really, some, some quantity is really positive, okay? There, there is no somehow smallness statement. Therefore, I mean, while they look similar, when really the proofs are kind of orthogonal or similar. And similarly, this theorem somehow in any case only gives local information close to TC and for that theorem one has to control completely different temperatures as well and one has to find different arguments. So they're related but they're really logically independent. So now let me tell you what we really do in this theorem, what we really prove. So I told you when one wants to prove such energy asymptotics, usually one does an upper bound and a lower bound. For the upper bound, one guesses a certain gamma and tries to make uh, this thing as small as possible, namely as small as this. And then for the lower bound, one has to show that for any gamma, um, this thing is actually a lower bound. And <coughs> we do this in a, we prove something uh, more general, namely for the upper bound, we do the following. So for every psi in H1, right, when I write H1 on the torus, I mean it's a periodic function, right? Every, everything here is periodic. Mm. I'm simplifying things here a little bit um, because there are some, some high frequency problems, but let me ignore those. So given uh, a psi, a ginsburg landau psi, we show there exists a gamma admissible for, for BCS such that the, the, en the BCS energy of this gamma, well, is equal to the energy of the normal state, but then plus h to the power four e d of psi plus, and again I write little o of h to the four, and by this I mean that this little o only depends on the m. Okay, so for any psi, I can build up a BCS state which achieves such uh, this energy inequality, and then of course what do I want to do? I would want to take psi the minimizing ginsburg landau theory. But I want to say that you don't need to, to take the minimizer. This is really holds for everyone. And uh, then we have an inequality, namely the two leading order, alpha minus. So alpha is the one, two entry of the gamma. And I'll tell you in a second what the alpha Ginsburg lambda of psi is. Um, yeah. 2, 2, this is equal to little o of h squared. Okay, so somehow this, uh, I think I'm missing, uh, this is 4. Right. This thing is order h squared. No, no, sorry, no, it's because it's a little o. This thing, alpha, will be order h just like in the translation variant case. Alpha will be order h, this is the leading term, and that this statement says exactly it's the leading term. This thing is smaller than the remainder. Okay, and now the second statement, that's a lower bound for every gamma, for which we know that its PCS energy is less than the BCS energy of the normal state plus m times h to the power 4. There exists a psi such that, um, well, the norm of psi is equal to, well, okay, well, okay. 
well, such again, such that I have this identity. And yeah, I mean, I'm writing down the same, really the exactly same things. Um, alpha minus alpha GL psi. Um, equal to little o of h squared, and psi itself is order 1. OK, now I should tell you really what the alpha Ginzburg-Landau is. And I tell you what its integral kernel is. So it's of order h. There's a two because I'll, I'll write it as a mean of two things. And the first thing is psi of x, 1 over h to the d, a star, remember a star is this guy in the kernel, x minus y over h plus 1 over h to the d, a star x minus y over h psi of y. Okay, so this thing, I want to think of, right, a star is a fixed function. So this means if I look at this function at x minus y over h, this means that x and y are very close together. So instead of writing a psi of x plus psi of y over 2, I can write psi of x plus y over 2. 1 over h to the d a star x minus y over h. And this thing you might recognize as the while quantization of the operator with symbol psi of x um, a um, star head of xi. Okay, so that depends on what, what you like. There, there are three things. This thing here, this is I think the, the important part, this form. So what this says is somehow that you have, you should look at the, the minimizer, actually at the, the all of gamma, separately in the relative coordinate and in the center of mass coordinate. In the relative coordinate, it lives on the scale h, on the, um, and it's given by exactly the same thing as in the translation variant case, right? So the, the formula from the first lecture was simply the one where psi is equal to zero. That was just this operator. Now, in the what happens when you turn on the external fields? Well, the alpha requires a modulation in the center of mass variable. This is a modulation which is of order 1, both in size and in scale, and its shape is determined by the Ginzburg-Landau minimization problem. The proper way to think about this and also about what's going to follow is somehow in terms of while quantization. Okay? That's somehow, so the idea is you have a function on, on phase space, it's a function of x and xi, and now you want to make out of this uh, an operator. And there are several ways of doing this, and the one that's um, most natural is actually the, the while quantization, which gives you, I mean, if this is... So, um, Symmetric, it gives you a, a, a self-adjoint operator. Okay, now that being said, we can do and we can explain the whole theorem in terms of the while calculus, but we cannot prove it in terms of this. That's because of regularity issues that I try to avoid at this point. So therefore, we do something um, like a poor man's quantization, and that's the first line here. The first line just says, well, take this, this is somehow, uh, right, this is somehow an operator of the momentum variable, multiplied by function of x, and then you do it because you want to have it uh, self-adjoint, you do it the other way around, like this. 
Okay, and so we have to work with this because later on in the proof there will be some, some cutoffs in the size and somehow we can control this in this um, direct uh, way much better. And I mean the, in the Wahl calculus there's just such a high loss of derivatives. You need much more derivatives than you actually have uh, for the final result that, that we cannot make this work. But I want to really present the, these three things to you. Okay, and so what this statement here says is roughly speaking that there's a bijection between states which satisfy such an energy condition with states in H1 with a bounded H1 norm. Okay, and so there's a bijection given for psi, for every psi I can give you a gamma. And conversely, for every gamma, I can extract a psi that does this job. Okay, so, <clears throat> and therefore it's, somehow, it's a more general statement than just a statement about the ground state energy. I'm saying this because it was already in one of the first lectures, it was somehow asked whether we can do similar things about equations, right? And so for equations, you would probably like to prove something similar now, probably H2 would be a better space and instead of some energy asymptotics you would have an almost solution of the say, say psi is a solution of the ginzburg landau equation you get an almost solution for the BCS equation and, and conversely. Okay, But that is in my opinion the, the, the right way of, of stating such a theorem and proving something like this. And I would also like to, to say that this is also, I hope, gives some perspective on how a time-dependent theorem should look like. So somehow you wanna, you have a, an equation on the gamma and using such a theorem, this perhaps this equation works in an energy setting, you wanna give that somehow a meaning in the, in the psi sense. And it should somehow commute with this bijection. I mean, th this, this thing, right, this gives you a map between gammas and psi's. And if the gammas involve, then the, the images, the psi should also evolve. Okay? And especially in the, in the time-dependent situation, you don't want to be at the ground state. So you need some a theorem like that, which is somehow higher up. Okay? Yes. So you can formulate this as a gamma convergence. Exactly, yes. Except that in, in gamma convergence, I think, um, right, there is, um, so first of all, they, they live in different spaces, but more importantly, somehow we give really explicit maps. I mean, right, I mean, you can summarize it in terms of gamma convergence, but the thing is really we, we tell you <laughs> somehow once you have this, apply this operator and, and this is what you get. Mm -hmm. But exactly, that's, that's somehow the, the philosophy behind it. Okay, good. So let me um, tell you a little bit of what goes into the proof. And I will more or less talk about the first part of the proof, which is the simpler one, right? I mean, this is the one where I'm given the psi and I just have to construct a gamma. Because, I mean, I have the, the psi is a small object and I have to make a big object. The really complicated thing is gamma is a big operator and I have to somehow compress it into a single psi. But I will tell you afterwards why when you have understood the first part, it's not impossible to understand the second part either. So how to prove one. So we will look at states of the following form. Now this will be terrible notationally because the delta here is not the Laplacian. Okay, it's just like in the first lecture, every physicist calls this function delta. Okay, and so I want to stick to that notation. But I hope it's clear somehow when the delta is this off-diagonal entry and when it's a Laplacian. Okay, and we again, we try to do it in terms of a Fermi-Dirac distribution. You might remember we've done something similar in the translation variant case. So I put here an H, this one particle operator from there. 
I put a minus h bar over there and then I put an operator delta up here. And how will this operator look, delta look like? Delta of x comma y, this will be two times v of x minus y times this alpha gl, which I just defined, psi of x comma y. Okay, so that's an explicit map that goes from psi's to operators gamma, right? Because I take my psi, I form this operator, a star is fixed once and for all, I define this operator, then I do this functional calculus and I compute this gamma. And the statement of the first thing is, well, that we have this both this energy expansion and secondly, that the one, two entry of this operator somehow recovers actually the thing that I've, I've put in there. Okay, that's kind of already kind of an uh, inverse. And I also want to emphasize that this is exactly the same thing as what we did in the second lecture in the translation variant case, right? If psi is equal to zero, that's simply two V A star. That's what we did back then. And again, my motivation for choosing this operator is I could look at the Euler equation satisfied by, by a minimizer, and I would find that exactly solves such an equation, except that here I don't have the alpha GL, but I have the true alpha. Okay? So this motivates this. I mean, and now I, yeah. And so I use this and I plug this into my functional up there. And I do a computation. This is an identity. There is nothing, nothing to, to be afraid of. Ft of gamma delta. Minus the energy of the normal state. Note, by the way, that this notation is consistent, right? If the delta is equal to zero, then um, this is exactly the, the normal state. Okay, so that's given by minus t over two. There was a h to the d, which I multiplied through. Trace of logarithm of one plus e to the minus one over t h delta minus the logarithm of 1 plus e to the minus 1 over th naught. Now there's a minus term, another minus term, h to the d integral r to the d times tau to the d v of x minus y over h, the alpha gl psi of x comma y squared dx dy. And then there's a third term plus h to the d, which looks similar. You see that somebody has uh, completed a square here in this formula. v of x minus y, and now this is alpha of x comma y minus, um, oh, sorry, alpha delta, alpha gl psi x comma y squared dx dy. <coughs> okay, let's stare at this, these terms for a while. I would like that the last term is a remainder term. This means that I want to show that if I take this alpha gl here, plug it into this operator, compute its one, two entry, then I get back the alpha GL psi up to lower order terms, okay? So this means I have to compute somehow um, asymptotically it's a, as h goes to zero, such an entry, okay? The, the one, two entry of this. And well, this can be done. It's a little bit, um, 
messy. I mean, you really, it's not a trace that you compute, but an operator, but that's fine also somehow since this is only form bounded, you need really an H1 control, not an L2 control, as I said. But let's ignore this remainder term because at the end of the day, this is a remainder. Let's talk about the second term. If in the second term, right, we would have, if you believed me that we could plug this in, this is the real while quantization. Well, what would we do? We would change variables into an x minus y integral and an x plus y integral. The x minus y integral, well, let's say first the x plus y integral, right? That this does not depend on it. So it just gives you the integral of psi squared. And then I do the minus y integral, and this gives us the v times a star squared, which is the term that we've seen before. Okay? And everything happens with a power of h squared, which just comes from the fact that this thing is about h squared. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a price to be paid because we took the wrong quantization, right? I mean, when you do different quantizations to leading order, they coincide, but then you get somehow differences in the commutators. So there is actually, because we do it, there's here one term that should not be there, but which can, is canceled by another term which uh, should not be in there. Okay, if you would do it in the, according to what the books say about the while calculus, then, then this would not be there. But let me ignore that issue. So for us, this term is really just psi, integral psi squared. So let me write this down. So, so third line is a remainder. Second line is something like minus h squared psi squared times integral v of x a star x squared dx and then plus terms we don't want to talk about which leaves us with the first line okay and I want to tell you a little bit more about the first line and what goes on there okay and I want to define a function f of z as the logarithm of 1 plus e to the z. And this is a nice and analytic function in a strip around the real axis. And so therefore, I can write, just by functional calculus, a logarithm of 1 plus e to the minus, oops, what am I doing? It's a minus here, sorry. Minus h delta over t minus logarithm 1 plus e to the minus h naught over t as equal to, well obviously it's the, just this h delta over t minus f of h naught over t and then in terms of resolvents this becomes 1 over 2 pi i integral f of z over t resolvent of the first one z minus h delta minus 1 over z minus h naught dz okay and now what's this contour here the contour is somehow this is the real axis you see this function has a pole at um, 2 pi i right so I just take uh, here a strip of width uh, the ha what am I saying pi so it's pi um, so at i pi it has a pole so therefore I take a strip of width pi t over 2 right because there, there's still a t there and now I integrate in that way from plus infinity parallel to the axis and I go back in that way so the formula is perhaps not as easy as it is because this function grows linearly. And so there is actually a contribution from infinity, but because I look at the difference, the contributions cancel. But apart from that, it's, um, it's the usual thing. Okay. Now we're gonna is expand. So we have the h, delta 
this is the H naught plus a delta delta bar uh, zero zero. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is if you remember what H zero is, okay, that's this H operator, the minus H bar operator. This is a diagonal operator. And this thing is an off-diagonal operator. So therefore, it's very easy when you um, expand such a thing. You can go to higher order than, I mean, with less effort to higher order than if you would not have such a structure. And you'll find that this is z minus h delta minus 1 over z minus h naught is equal to um, so it's uh, 1 over z minus h naught. Let me do it. Let me do it right away for the 1, 1 entry. Okay. So for the 1, 1 entry, I have an h here. Uh -huh. uh, a delta a 1 over z plus h bar. A delta bar. Uh, 1 over z minus h now plus 1 over z minus h delta 1 over z plus h bar delta bar 1 over z minus h delta 1 over z plus h bar delta bar 1 over z minus h plus some things which are small. So what I want to emphasize, this is really comes from the algebraic structure of the setup, is that there are no terms linear or cubic in delta. Okay, that's really what 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 we will see later on in the in the um, in the Ginzburg-Landau functional. Remember also that the delta is proportional to alpha. The alpha is proportional to psi. So in other words, this is a psi squared term. And this is a psi to the power 4 term. OK? And well, the remainder is hopefully small. And so this should give the, the quadratic terms in the ginzburg lander functional this, the, the power 4 terms. So now the next thing we do, I mean, I guess you can see this already. Um, this h defined up there and I want to think of this as minus h squared Laplacian minus mu and now there's a plus with an h in front minus i nabla h a plus a minus i h nabla plus h squared a squared plus w Mm -hmm. One thing, if, that, if you haven't seen the, these type of computations before, the important thing is an h in front of a differential operator is not small. You always want to, every differential operator wants to keep an h. But then if there's some left over h, this is truly small. So this really is a term of order h, this is a term of order h squared. Okay, and so now we call this thing h naught. And now if in the last term we replace the, the h naught term, um, every h by an h naught, and if we ignore that we have commutators, right? I mean this delta is a function of, of this is a function of x, this is a function of xi, if we ignore this and we put all the all the psi's on one side and all the I mean all the, the x's on one side and all the psi's on the other side, then this term here gives us the, the, the psi to the power four term. It's really the same computation as before. Okay? So I mean no, I should not say it's the same well. You can do the, the computation and translation variant case such that you see that at the end of the day you compute the same integral. 
Okay, so the delta, the term with four deltas gives a psi to the power four with the, the, the lambda three. Here all commutators can be ignored. So let's talk about the other term. So now we want to expand 1 over z minus h as 1 over z minus h naught plus 1 over z minus h naught. Now we have all this stuff, right? So there is a, I don't know how much I want to write. So there is an h times this term which goes in a is proportional to a plus an h squared times a squared plus w squared. That's h naught. And then there is yet this term I have to take into account once again, z minus h naught, h, this a stuff, one over z minus h naught, h a one over z minus h naught plus higher order terms. Okay. Now, once again, let me perhaps tell you a little bit more of what I meant up there. So the first term, the one where everything is now expanded, is this term here, where every h is an h naught. So that's a trace of 1 over z minus h naught delta 1 over z plus h naught. I don't need to write a bar because the, the h naught is a real operator. z minus h naught. And now I, what do I have? I remember that delta is really, um, where is it, 2? Let me write it like this. There's an h over 2. There's an operator psi of x plus an operator t of minus i h nabla plus the other way around. Okay, what I said was, and th these are also operators to, uh, of minus i h nabla. So to leading order, this thing is just, 1 over z minus h naught squared 1 over z plus h naught um, and now there is a t minus i h nabla squared okay from here and then there is uh, there of course I mean there's an h squared in front just because it's a delta squared and then there's a psi of x squared so that is this thing here gives you exactly the well, okay. this gives you exactly a star one over kt ktc one over kt a star. If you think right there, so there's a temperature difference here involved. If we ignore that, to leading order, this is a minus h squared a k t k t a. This goes together with that term, which I call the second line. These are the h squared terms, the ones that we want to cancel. They go away because a star is in the kernel. So there's psi squared is just, uh, right, sorry, I forgot to write psi squared here. This is of course so psi squared times that. Okay, now this term and that term cancel each other. They're equal to zero because I'm in the kernel of this operator. It's exactly like in the translation variant case. Now we have to go on. Now we now so, so far everything we've seen was uh, like in the translation variant case just written in a more complicated way. Now 
when I wrote this equality, I made a mistake, right? Because I just pulled the, the psi somehow through this derivative. This derivative, when you, when you pull it through, this gives you a commutator, which is of order h. Now, by some even oddness, you can actually see that the term of order h is equal to zero, and what really contributes is a, a term of a order h squared, okay? And this comes um, now when every psi has a gradient, okay? So the, I don't know how much, in how much detail I should explain this plus, so there's a h to the power four, and now, I mean, at the end of the day, what you get is exactly this lambda naught one half minus i nabla plus two, well, no, just, just this, psi squared. Yes? It really, it really comes just from 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 looking at, at the difference of these two, you can write it out say in, in Fourier series if you really want to do it by hand. Because I mean I know one can do this in a very um, nice and elegant way. But our point is we will not do this computation, but we have lots of cutoffs in there. And we have to do everything very, very carefully. And somehow remove the, the cutoffs in the in the right way or some some, some terms blow up actually, and, and therefore I wanted to really show you the, the basic really way of doing it, and then you adapt this and, and, and generalize this. Um, let me just um, continue. So now this uh, gave, gave us this term there, and now you see, for instance, there's a W term, which is quadratic, which I guess you can see from here, there's a h squared w squared term, right? So that's again a very easy term because uh, you have those. And uh, similarly, the a terms you have to, to put together. And the fact that the, that the two in front of the a appears is something like a miracle if you look at it from this point of view. You I mean, because you, you separate all the terms and then you put them together and, and it works. It's a little bit more um, obvious when you really look at this formula where you differentiate and you, you see somehow when you, um, that this is because this one over two, right? So I mean, th this is done in order to have a Jacobian one. When you, when you change variables. And now this two somehow is eventually responsible for the two in front of the gradient when you expand such a function. Um, so the... So uh, yes? Say one thing, like the formal calculation using vi uh, yes. quantization, you will not get these two terms that cancel. Exactly, that's correct, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, it's, so easier, like yes, yes, exactly. I mean, that was also how we, how we do, did originally, I mean, right before you do all the computation, you check whether it, there's a chance that it works and then you plug everything into the Weyl calculus and you, you just compute according to this and then you get a nice expansion for all the terms. And then it turned out when you do this, um, then, uh, then actually there were some extra terms, which is not surprising because we, the, these different quantizations differ by, by low order uh, terms. And then, but one can actually find them together and, and put them together. I should say that even, even if you do it with while calculus, it, it's quite a lot of work because if you look in the books, what the books tell you is somehow, well, there e exists an, an infinite asymptotic expansion in H and then they give you the first term, and perhaps they tell you that the, the, I mean, the zeroth order term, then they tell you perhaps that the first term is equal to zero if the subprincipal symbol is equal to zero, and then they don't tell you anything else. Perhaps in some research paper you can find the h squared term. But really to go to this order h to the power four, I mean to fifth order, doing all the computations is actually quite, quite heavy. And it, especially because we have the magnetic field. So we also have to, terms that do not contribute to the trace do contribute to the state. 
and you have to keep those. There are books where you can find the, the, the whole expansion and even the, the exact symbol in terms of an integral. Okay. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. I mean, we, we used mostly this um, by Didier Robert, this Autour de la, la Proximation Semi-Classique. And... Mm, okay. Okay, well, anyway, so we, we sweat it somewhat here. But um, let me... And another... So there, there are two difficulties, I mean, um, which I perhaps explained is somehow when you, when you do these commutators, then, then you get derivatives. This is how this comes about, but to all control the higher order terms, you somehow would need more than that. And the other difficulty is also that this operator is not bounded from below, but it has this, um, this strut where this is somehow has spectrum from zero to infinity and this from minus infinity to zero somewhat. And what's, so that is something, and then th this, that this function is, uh, grows linearly, means that because once you have this um, analytic integral representation, you, you put in absolute values. So somehow you have to, uh, to beat a linear growth here. So the difficulty is not the closeness to the, the, the real axis, but somehow the growth of this function in one uh, direction. And again, this can be done some by an ad hoc method using the, the special structure that we, that we have there. That was what I wanted to say about one, how to prove one. Let me say something about two, well, which is actually the, the main part, the really difficult part of the paper, how to prove two. Mm. That uses somehow these semi-classical analysis um, ideas together with calculus of variation ideas. So you somehow want to use say a gap inequality or what some coercivity away from some ground state in order to get some regularity for, 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 uh, for functions above, okay? That you use this in order to say that for your minimizer alpha, alpha, the function has to be of such a form in a certain sense, that everything which is projected away would have a higher energy and therefore has to have a very small coefficient. Okay, once you have this, you can do, can run such a semi-classical argument to a certain limited order. Now you plug this back into the nonlinear equation, you do some nonlinear bootstrap to gain lin an, um, a regularity and then you can run this thing almost fully um, almost fully is again you need to to cut off some some high frequencies and uh, and do something and there is of course you get I mean there you cannot get anything for free so you have to find some cancellation somewhere which allows you to put in a cutoff. I know that this is all very vague I just wanted to tell you even for the lower bound you need to understand this computation you need to understand this computation where the limitations are and and how to deal with those. So, I mean, let me just to summarize here, use, use nonlinear analysis, nonlinear analysis to show that gamma is almost of the form in one and then you can do the one computation. Okay, my time is almost up. I wanted to conclude these uh, lectures by stating some challenges for future work. As you see, I mean, this is a rather recent development. There are not so many works and I think there, there are many interesting questions both uh, difficult and, and more uh, straightforward. And 
I think it would be nice if, as I already mentioned, if I uh, could have motivated you to, to look into some of these. The one that's certainly closest to this workshop is the, the, to derive the time dependent, dependent ginzburg landau equations. I said, so there are works by Gorkov, Eliasberg. So Gorkov is the one who somehow proved in quotation marks this theorem. He used a completely different strategy of what we do. I mean, I don't think, I don't see whether there is any way of making rigorous what he did. So what we do is perhaps m closer to what Dejen did, although Dejen did it on an equation level. Anyway, so perhaps looking at our proof, comparing it with Gorkov's proof in the stationary case, would tell someone um, how to look at the gorkov eliasberg proof. This is like Gorkov's stationary proof in the same uh, framework. Um, and then there's a, ger a paper by a German physicist who's called Schmidt, who was actually before gorkov eliasberg And that would be nice. I mean, just think about it physically. What you want to say, at least in one regime, is that you, if you're above the critical temperature, so your system does not want to be superconductivity, superconducting. However, you start with a state which has some superconductivity built in, then you should lose this over time. Okay? So that's, I mean, a very, very naive thing. And this would mean that somehow the alpha propagates into the gamma in some <coughs> sense. Okay? So <clears throat> That is a little bit, and there was this question that you asked, Tama, whether this is a dispersive or a dissipative equation. So above the critical temperature, I would expect the dissipative equation, which makes the psi disappear. But um, there are certainly other regimes, and there is also a dispersive which regime. Alpha, yes, like excuse me? Which means psi disappear or alpha disappear? They're the same. I mean, if you look at this formula, the A star is a universal thing, and then psi is right. I mean, we always think somewhere in this framework. So this would also be kind of a semi-classical theorem, where, where somehow there, there is. So basically, if psi is not there, alpha is not there. But yes, exactly, right. Psi, see, psi just describes the variation of alpha on the center of mass scale. And there's always a universal A star, and the A star cannot move for energetic reasons I, I, during, time, during the time evolution. So that's one. The other thing that I mentioned, of course, that's um, very difficult is somehow derive BCS from many body quantum mechanics. Well, from, yeah, from quantum mechanics, from real quantum mechanics. Let me write from first principles. There is some work by uh, Trubowitz and Knurra in this direction, but I think it's fair to say that this is not yet um, satisfactorily understood and I don't really know what to say about this. Let me come back here closer to this framework. One thing, if you remember how you might have seen the Ginzburg-Landau functional in the literature, people usually also minimize over the A, right? So the physical setup is you apply an, a magnetic field and then the system has a response magnetic field, which actually typically wants to cancel the, the magnetic field that you put on. Okay? So somehow there, there's an external field and then there's one that's generated by the system. So this would mean that in our first equation up there, we would have to um, minimize also over A but then somehow add a penalization term which somehow says that this A does not want to, to go away too far from the, the given A or something. Okay? We have not been able to, to derive this Ginzburg-Landau um, functional with this um, what's called self-generated magnetic field. This would be very interesting because this would explain the Meissner effect, which is a phenomenon that, that is typically associated with superconductivity. It's essentially based on the fact that semi-classics is very hard with, with an A, with a first order perturbation, and that you really need to use that, where did I write it? I mean, that some terms, um, 
right, that this somehow vanishes when you integrate over xi, roughly speaking. So you need to use such a cancellation property, which is rather hard. So that's so um, self-consistent, consistent magnetic field. And the last thing that I also mentioned before in the course was that we ignore a boundary, whereas um, the boundary actually plays uh, an important role in Ginzburg-Landau theory. There are these Neumann boundary conditions, or even they're called Duchenne boundary conditions in this context, because Duchenne really somehow explained how important they are, in particular if you couple two materials. And we don't understand how this works. Um, but it would be certainly a, a very interesting uh, problem. So I think that's all I have to say. I thank you for your attention and please ask questions if you have any. You said that you excluded the boundary from the very beginning. Uh, you comment on that. What, what, uh, what are, would be the difficulties in this uh, approach? Okay, um, good. I think, I think the difficulties are not so much in the semi-classical approach. I mean, we know that semi-classics is very difficult with the boundary. Mm -hmm. And that might be, I mean, an even worse problem, but we don't really know how to start. So, I mean, with the boundary, it's, if you see somehow, we got only an h squared term and an h to the power 4 term. Boundary would give you terms in between. Okay? Now, <coughs> what, what is, however, the, the, the bigger problem is that we don't know um, if the, the gamma satisfies um, directly boundary conditions. Okay, why is it enough that the psi satisfies Neumann boundary conditions? Okay, why do you, in other words, somehow you, why do you pay this localization error only once? Why if you paid it somehow for the gamma? So the electrons have to pay the localization error. They, they have to disappear when they go to the boundary. Why do the Cooper pairs not have to pay the price? <coughs> But somehow in, in, in physical terms, why it does it somehow not matter for the psi? Even So the psi perhaps might go down at the boundary, somehow on an age-dependent scale. But there is a, must be a cancellation that, that this, which means that you go down, so you have a big change in psi, is not, um, does not appear in this functional. I, I guess I cannot say much more. It's, Hmm? Okay, oops. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, uh, hmm? uh, 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 see from your, uh, your, the thing you are saying, I uh, understand many things, not completely, but uh, you are very close to have a bijection, I think, uh, without. Uh, so it's just a question of regularity, maybe. Or, or right, exactly. So, I mean, what I've written down there is not completely true. I've oversimplified the situation, right? And I ignored regularity issues with the H2. But, but problem, I guess, huh? yes, I guess that's true, right? Exactly, okay. right. So, can you comment on this problem specific? Okay. <laughs> Do you think it's a um, big problem or it's just. Uh, to okay. mm -hmm. I mean, it's. See, whenever I, I wrote here, um, where were we? For instance, I mean the, the the next terms, so to say, I mm, I need to control those, and morally I need one derivative more because there is somehow one more commutator here to control. So if I want to derive an H one theory, I would need an H two assumption in order for for the next term to be finite, and. I think that would be something that one would have to understand much better somehow to work directly with these terms, just stay at the level of, of derivatives one, one has. Okay. And it, the only way, as I perhaps said, I mean, we prove H2 bounds, but then there is, 
coming from the equation, there's a structure, there's a certain term that is zero. And this gives you the space to really remove the cutoff. Uh, okay, so mm. since, uh, uh, okay, you need a kind of more specific regularity, very, very specific. Yes. Right, exactly. I mean, the reason, perhaps I should say this, the reason why one can expect anything better in, in general at all is somehow because we work with the Laplacian. The main term is the Laplacian, and this just, if you take uh, three derivatives of Xi, then this is gone. Okay. Or even if you two, then you don't pay any commutators anymore. So therefore, this is much better than general uh, theorems about commutators would, would allow you to, okay. to, to conclude. But this is somehow still not enough. This gives us some way, but still there's at the end, there's still a little bit where we need much more about the structure of the problem. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question I had is about, uh, uh, well, it's a time evolution uh, mm -hmm. so question. Uh, if you, okay, so if you put uh, not it, uh, but okay, uh, uh, and uh, Schrödinger or even perturb uh, with a dissipa dissipative term near the near the ground state. Can, uh, is there somebody <coughs> that describes uh, the asymptotic in large time or things like that? Uh, or is, is there any work, serious work on uh, qualitative work on that? I should perhaps mention so a feature that is. Um, crucial here is, I guess, that we work at positive density, okay? This means that <coughs> uh, there's somehow a background, if you, you see what I mean. Now, there is a simpler version of this problem, which is in the vacuum, okay? Which, and there, um, Heinzel and Schlein, so this is, this is now in the BEC regime which has the other simplification. See, this mu for us, the mu is positive, so therefore this is inside the continuous spectrum. So if there is some, if we expect some um, dissipative uh, terms to occur, then they would come from a Fermi Golden Rule. That there's some, something goes in there. However, in this simpler regime where you are at, at uh, zero density, um, mu, and mu is negative, so therefore you, you're away from the continuous spectrum. There there is a work of Heinzel and Schlein, Schlein where they derive from this uh, setup. So again, there's an alpha and there's a gamma. And in this setup, they derive the, the gross Pitayevsky e equation. Gross uh, Pitayevsky equation from and I say similar, but it's, I mean, it's significantly simpler from similar BCS model. And this is how, so gross Pidevsky, this is a dispersive equation, right? I mean, it's cubic, uh, cubic NLS, dispersive um, defocusing. Um, so this dispersive equation and here, the difficulty would be somehow to see that for positive mu, you really get these dissipative effects. I mean, that, that would be the really new feature there, which makes superconductivity disappear. That's not, not present there. But still, it might be helpful if people want to look at this, how somehow how one works with such gammas and alphas on a time-dependent level. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, other questions or remarks? If not, okay. you can find the speaker okay. from the screen. Thank you. Thank you.